Greg Beatty Velasquez bringing you an exclusive interview today with a Hall of Fame DJ, a pioneer, a great human being, a great friend, and this is true as compared to otherwise, Mr. Bob Nero. Bob, say hello to you. Hello, how are you doing today? Good. Nice to be here. Bob, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, Bob has been involved in the music business and has been for a long time and he's got a list of uh, perhaps memories of the past and uh, obviously his tenure is something to be recognized today uh, in today's market and today's arena. Bob, what are some of your biggest memories? of your experience spinning records involved in the business? Uh, well, um, I had uh, the, uh, the great occasion to be employed in uh, several large clubs. Um, the first one of the large ones was in San Francisco, a club called Studio West. And there, um, I spun um, five nights a week, and it was a really strange situation because sometimes my shift started at midnight, and I went until six in the morning. Interesting. Yeah, and before Very that, I would be taking a nap. I'd get up, take a shower. <laughs> you know, like most people who work nine to five, but I would be walking into a club at midnight, probably half asleep with my coffee in my hand, and here's 3,000 people going, ah! <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing? That's quite uh, a memory. You know, I'm pretty sure all of us have memories of the 70s and the excitement. Yeah, this was uh, you know, 1970, uh, 77, 78, 79, yeah. and 80. Right where the, the peaking was beginning with, uh, right. with all of this. Um, any 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 comparisons with the music of that era as compared to what we're seeing today, the evolution of where we are with music today? Any any comments on your your view based on the fact that you've had that experience that a lot of the music industry today, DJs today, don't have? You know, anything that you see uh, in that evolution that strikes you as either great or, or a little bit out of sync with, with, with your projection of where you thought things might be. Well, as we both know, music changes all the time. It goes through good phases, it goes through very stale phases, it goes through times when I don't know how these poor guys get anybody to dance because nothing or not enough is being produced that really has the energy in it. The difference today I find is that when you and I were playing, because I, I went from San Francisco to Fort Lauderdale and there at Backstreet I spun you know, all of the years of Backstreet and what I found there is that the people who were producing music, and there were so many of them, you know, um, they had the ability to bring in horns, to bring in a different drum, bass lines, violins. I remember the Ritchie family, you know, they did big orchestrations. Today, um, I think probably half of the music comes out of somebody's studio in their house, in right. their bedroom, yeah. in their garage. Yeah. And they don't have that same kind of ability, ability to it's a very, get it. In other words, very limited. it's a very mechanical uh, setting today with music. And 
I agree with you. Um, you know, back then the music was a little bit more song oriented. There was there was yes, the there was a beginning, a middle, and an end. Like reading, watching a good movie. You know, and today it's very bland. It's just a straight shot and giving you something mechanical. And if you're in a club listening to these straight. Yes. You know, one after another. After a while, you're not getting anything. You no, know, it's it's redundant. That's, it's boring. Yeah. So but I think that's lost, and I agree with you. Years ago, the, the music, um, the songs were produced that um, had lyrics, they had hooks, they had verses. So people kind of sang, you know, different parts of the song. People knew different parts of the song, and. Um, that's many, a very good point. Many of my years in point. Backstreet, I enjoy taking two versions of the same record and playing it the way I thought it should be played backwards, forward. And what would happen is when people on the dance floor are think they're singing to the right song, all of a sudden it would change and they're in a different verse. And that was part of the element of the shot. Right. Okay. And it's all very emotional. It's a very emotional set. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so today that, that's kind of lost, even though the, uh, the technology has become very interesting and very unique and perhaps a little bit quote unquote, unquote better. But the whole spirit of the of the song has been lost a little bit and that takes I away from the club environment. I think. I think some of the quality, although they say digital is in theory better than vinyl, uh, I have always felt that the fullness of a vinyl recording, the, uh, the amount of music that can be put on into a group, even though humanly we have limitations as to what we can hear, the music is still produced, it's still there, and if we could hear it, well, in, in its totality, we do hear it. And so, there's a different sound today. Right. It's a lot drier, it's a lot sharper. Yeah. And in the days when we were playing, in, in the heyday, in the, you know, 80s, 80s to the 80s, late 80s into the 90s, uh, the music was fuller. It was very different. It was warmer. Uh, absolutely, today. absolutely. And there's a lot of things that I would do with vinyl that I know can be done with a computer, but it's very different. It's very different. It's not like the mechanics of it. You're sitting, you know, in front of a computer putting files together, which is okay. I mean, don't get me wrong, there isn't any vinyl. So right. you have to do something. Right. Right. I got a question. Yes. What was your aha moment when you knew you wanted to do this and you knew that you could do this? Well, wanted is a, a kind of a, a broad answer because I've loved music since I could hear, I guess. Uh, being brought up in a Puerto Rican family, and I don't know. That. I didn't know that, uh, but. Uh... Yeah, I, I was basically uh, a New York weekend, there you go. born in Brooklyn, but uh, you too, huh? All right. So we're all in the same so, club here. So the music is something that's in your blood, and it's, and it's something that's one of your first loves. Yeah. You know, and I remember when I was just coming out of high school in New York, when I was growing up, you could drink at 18. Right. So I would go to clubs with uncles of mine who were not married yet, and we would go see Mongo Santa Maria, uh, Santana, all of these people play live with little clubs. And it was just a great experience. So the music yeah. is something that... Yeah, I you know, think, I think that basically I think what you're really kind of circling with the, the, uh, the concept of the emotion of the music. Emotionally, there was something there, you know, in the clubs. Musically, lyrically. You know, and when you put songs together as a DJ in a club and you're providing stories after stories after stories and melodies, you are you are communicating an emotion uh, that's beyond words. And today a little bit has been lost the mechanics. It's all in the and I think there's a need to go back to it. 
I believe some of it is beginning to come back. I listened to some of the new houses coming out. Yeah, it's changing and, again. Yeah, it's changing it's again. I think, I think there's a there's an undertone saying that we're, we, we've had enough of this blandness. Let's get some, you know, some Different. real stuff, maybe some of the old stuff back involved in today's music. Right. So, um, how do you feel about the legends of vinyl and what they represent today? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I think it's about time somebody recognized the fact that there are people out there who kind of laid the groundwork for what's happening today. Absolutely. And little do they know that in many many places, many areas, what's happening today is nowhere near what was happening then. Oh. You know, the feelings oh, about God bless you. Oh, like night and day. And you asked me about an aha moment. I'm going to give you an aha moment. I can tell you at Backstreet with maybe 3,000 people in the room, um, playing two copies of something, an instrumental and a vocal at the same time, and being able to get the crowd to trust you enough to do whatever I wanted. I would play the instrumental and I would lay words underneath and they would sing, they start singing, you know, and then I would take the instrumental out. So they're singing to an acapella and then I take the acapella out. And at that moment they are singing and there's nothing else on and that's when I say, uh -huh. That's, uh -huh. That's the magic. All of you here are mine. <laughs> that's, what it became, that's what it became emotional. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And there's nothing that we can be higher than that. And I'm telling you, my light man, he used to say to me, Damn, you give me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just amazing. It's wonderful. It all, really all of us that were in that position have experienced that one, and we've all felt the same thing. And unless you're behind the booth, you don't know what that feeling's like. No. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. my brother, who's a great guy and love him to death, is a, is a pilot. He's a pilot, a captain for JetBlue. And I imagine we have conversations about responsibility about the people who are behind you, or in my case, in front of me. Right, right. And how similar, <laughs> you know, here he is. Well, it's very different, but in some ways the same. For him, he has their lives in his hands, but me, I only had to entertain these people. Right, right. But still, it's a sense of being the leader yeah, of whatever. Like, like, like taking someone on a trip. Exactly. You're taking your, your audience on a trip. Exactly. The pilot is doing the same thing, so that sense of of leadership and trust, yes. trust in the DJ, trust in the pilot, that the, that both of you are going to do the right thing emotionally yes. to make it all worth And it takes a long time yeah. to get that trust. Pinky and I discuss trust with ownership. Oh, yes, yeah, they absolutely. It's a very so, per per precarious kind of uh, position. Where ownership gave you the, gave you the, the freedom yes, to, do to control or they restricted you. Right. Right. And I'll tell you a funny story. Um, my boss at the time, who uh, is now long gone for a guy at Bank Street, um, there were nights when the club was very, very busy, very, very packed. And so the fire marshal would come in. And I remember one night he came to the booth, the fire marshal, and he showed me his badge, and he had his little hat on, and he says to me, are you in DJ? I said, yes. He said, well, you have to shut off the music and tell five or six hundred people that they have to leave because the club is overcrowded. Oh, right. I said, yeah, wonderful. do you know what kind of panic that was causing me there? I said, first of all, you should have given him the mic. Let him, let let him, him do it. First of all, you either have to arrest me, or, or, you, do. or, you, or you have to bring me the owner here to tell me to do it. Right. So he says, I'll be back. So I said, okay, and I keep playing. Well, 15 minutes later, he's back with the owner. And the owner says, you got to do what he says. I said, all right. So I tell the guy, come up into the booth. Yeah. So he comes up into the booth with his little uniform and his little hat. And I turned the music all the way down. I opened my mic and I said, all of you out there, I want you to 
you meet somebody that's five years old before going down. And he has told me that since we have so many people here, five or six hundred of you have to leave. Great. And How did I go over? Place, I mean, the man shrunk down like this. He wanted to get up and eat the table. And he said, put the music on. That was great. I love that one. I love that one. That was the best I've heard. <laughs> and true, right? I am sure. Put a fire marshal in his place. <laughs> They'll never do that again, right? Oh, no. Okay, keep the club crowded. <laughs> Anyway, that was good. This was, this was <laughs> great. That happens. That happens. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, um, there's that uh, point where people don't understand that magnitude of what's really going on in a club. Even club owners sometimes, yeah. you know, they don't understand the, the DJ's mindset in the DJ booth. The preparation that goes on to the evening, the creativity, the creativity, yeah. all that is working while there's a record playing. And sometimes the DJ is thinking far beyond that. You know, thinking about what am I, what should this be in another half hour, or an hour? Should I, should I change the, the the atmosphere a little bit musically? All this is going on in the DJ's mind, which transposes into the floor. And club owners sometimes, you know, do not understand. Right. You know, they think it's just records, and sometimes they think that, well. These are the records that should be played because I go to other clubs and hear these records and DJ, my DJ should be playing these records. That's you know, and that's not all he wants to get. Right. <laughs> or something like that. And I think uh, many times there's been a lack of trust and misunderstanding right. between club owners and DJs. Well, I was very lucky. To you, uh, uh, I, I've been very lucky. The, the man I had in Back Street where I spent the most of my yeah. time um, was the type of guy, and people would tell him, you know, you should play a shitty record every now and then and clear the floor and let them go get a drink. Well, the owner used to say, as long as you've got people on the floor, I don't care that there's nobody at the bar because eventually they're going to be so tired, they got to go get a drink because they're sweating. Make them dance. Wait, you know, I had, you know, I had, I, I used to work in a club, Bob, and not, not to take away from you for a second here, because you're the star here in this interview, but, you know, I worked in a club in Connecticut where the club owner would actually turn the heat up in the summer, in the middle of the night, to get more people to go to the bar. <laughs> oh, when it's crowded, people don't know. They think it's their own body. Was he cheap? Was he cheap? <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it yeah. work. You know, yeah, we're, we're not, not, not the right way to do it, but... No. No, I'll but, tell you, in Florida, yeah. we don't have that problem. We don't have that. <laughs> it's always hot outside. Bob, if you want to turn the heat on, just open the doors. <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you here to, uh, this evening. Pleasure. And we're here at the Winter Music Conference right. in Miami, uh, March 22nd, right, uh, Friday night. And uh, we just talked to Mr. Bob Nero, a legend of vinyl, a legend period in the music business and our pleasure to interview you tonight uh, on behalf of the Legends of Vinyl and remember that LOD is always the best. Thank you and thank you all.